Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the June council meeting for uh, NIEHS. So thank you all for, well, actually thank all of the council members for your time, and as well as others for your tuning in with us. Uh, I actually found yesterday's meeting to be uh, really pretty interesting, and uh, some of the discussions about exposomics were, were pretty exciting. Although I do want to clarify, and I, I want to thank Irva for pointing this out to me, that the, the uh, referring to you know, lighting the match and various things is something we probably don't want to do, because uh, there are a lot of people who have been impacted by the wildfires and all sorts of disasters that are happening out west. So I'm going to be very careful not, not to use that, uh, that uh, example. So we'll, we'll come up with an alternative um, way of uh, trying to describe how we can get people interested and excited about various things. But we want to be very sensitive to people who have suffered from some very devastating uh, climate related um, uh, events. So uh, anyway, so I apologize for all of you who may have taken offense by that. Uh, and totally understanding why that could happen. And I'll work very carefully to make sure it doesn't happen. So again, thank you, Irva, for pointing that out. I think this came through in the chat box. So, and I also want to apologize for Karen for being a little preoccupied yesterday when you were asking me questions. Uh, the good news is I actually did get my, um, my outlook and everything else working again, so I don't feel quite as panicked this morning. So, well, you actually answered two questions for me then, so it turned out better. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so let me turn the virtual platform over to Gary. So where's Gary? I can't see him. Here I am. Gary. Where? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Gary, well, tell you what, yeah. the virtual platform is yours. <laughs> let's get the show on the road this morning. Yeah, let's go. Um, thank you, uh, Rick. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for your attendance today and um, your attention. We have a lot to, to do this morning, so let's get right to it. Um, first, I think it's worth repeating some of our house, housekeeping rules um, for, for those of you who may not have been on yesterday. Um, this meeting is being webcasted, and it is important for microphones to be turned off after speaking. So mute your microphone and remain so until recognized. Return to mute after speaking. And reminder to turn off your video and mute during the break. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to remind you of is to, um, if, you are, if you have VPN, um, please disable it uh, while we're um, in meeting. So let's get started. First, I would like to express my gratitude to all of my DERT colleagues uh, who worked tirelessly to help keep our extramural enterprise going strong and for all of their efforts in helping me uh, prepare for council. It is a phenomenal effort and I greatly appreciate it. So next slide, please. So today, what I'd like to talk about is, um, you know, the introduced new staff uh, show recent and upcoming DERT meetings, uh, discuss recent Autism Awareness Month activities, and, th and then present two research portfolio areas, uh, environmental health disparities, environmental justice, and climate change, and end with an update on some of our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Next slide, please. So first, staff updates. Next slide. Thank you. It is with excitement that I introduce Dr. Quentin Lee. And uh, Dr. Lee, if you're here, um, please raise your hand so that people can see you. Uh, Dr. Lee will join NIEHS's DERT as a scientific review officer on June 7th. Dr. Lee comes to us after completing a one and a half year detail as a scientific review officer at the Center for Scientific Review. And Dr. Lee first joined NIH in 2006, first as a scientist at NIAID, studying iso drug resistance and fungal infections using molecular genetic and genomic approaches. Then at NCI, investigating the mechanism of histone methylation in the epigenetic regulation of immediate early gene expression in T cells and leukemia cells. He also conducted translational and preclinical studies in bladder cancer using epigenetic and proteomic approaches. 
Dr. Lee is a medical doctor by training, having worked in a hospital in Southern China. He earned a Master of Science in Microbiology and Immunology and a PhD in Pharmacology and Therapeutics at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. He completed postdoctoral training in oncology and cancer biology at NCI and served on the faculty of West Virginia University School of Medicine as a faculty member in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Cell Biology. Dr. Lee has co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and reviews and presented more than 70 papers at national and international scientific uh, meetings. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Lee to our staff. Um, we're very excited to have him. Next slide, please. There are uh, a few meetings that have occurred since our last council meeting in February and some that are upcoming in the, in, in the next few months before the next council meeting that I'd like to share with you. Next slide, please. First, several meetings occurred between February and May. For example, the use of big data to characterize social and environmental determinants of health occurred on February 22nd, which was part of the NIH EPA Environmental Health Disparities webinar series. NIEHS, NIMHD, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and EPA brought together funded researchers to discuss GIS-based environmental mapping of uranium mine contamination on the Navajo Nation, disparities in COVID-19 mortality, and development of a geographic information system to study social and environmental determinants of health. These presentations are available on the NIEHS website. Also, there were events in recognition of Autism Awareness Month, without, which I will cover later, and the Environmental Health Sciences Core Centers held a webinar on anti-racism, motivating action with accountability. These were important and powerful discussions about what we can do within our own fears to create and maintain anti-racist environments. And a few council members participated in this webinar. I know that um, Bob Wright and Katrina Korfmacher uh, were, participated in that as well as uh, some of our DIRT colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. So upcoming meetings include uh, integrating multi-scale environmental exposure data into large population-based studies. This is an annual meeting that will be held on June 15th and 16th. You, you might recall that Gary Miller mentioned this meeting during his talk yesterday. Uh, it will cover geospatial technologies and human health, measurement error, spatial temporal modeling and mobility, big data and analytical considerations, and next steps with perspectives from population health studies. Our Superfund research pro programs, risk communication strategies to reduce exposure and improve uh, health meeting will occur on June 21st and 22nd. This meeting will discuss strategies to communicate potential health risks, prevent and reduce exposures and improve health. And then there are several upcoming meetings and presentations on diversity, equity, inclusion, and disparities, including the Structural Racism webinar series, the Exposure Pathways and Environmental Health Disparities presentation, which will be held on June 28th, and the Diversity Supplement Recipient meeting uh, that will be held uh, sometime in July. And I don't know if we have a date for that yet. Uh, next slide, please. We will also participate in upcoming international meetings. You know that the International Society of, of Exposure Science is coming up in August. And Dr. Lindsay Martin, uh, uh, who is a member, uh, one of our DERT colleagues, will conduct a pre-conference workshop introducing implementation science for environmental health. And Dr. Melissa Smar, Mike Humble, and Erica Reed will participate in a workshop that will occur before ISES, ISES and uh, the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology, ISEE, focused on demystifying the grant application process. It will include panelists from our grantee community that will discuss strategies to increase recruitment and retention of PIs and students from groups that have been historically underrepresented in um, biomedical research. 
Another meeting that I want to bring to your attention is one that is being led by Dr. Dan Shaughnessy in, uh, in our program. It's the workshop on extracellular vesicles, exosomes, and cell cell signaling in response to environmental stress. And this meeting will be held on September 27th and 28th. And this virtual workshop will include uh, an overview on talks um, related to um, extracellular vesicle biology, or I call EV, development of state-of-the-art methods for EV isolation and characterization, and application of EV research to environmental exposures and disease. Next slide, please. And I, I want to mention that um, some of these meetings are listed on our website. Some have slides, uh, some of the previous meetings have uh, slides available, uh, recordings available for you to view. Uh, and then others uh, meetings such as the one in September will be updated on our website shortly. And I believe they are all open. Okay, uh, uh, April was Autism Awareness Month and uh, NIEHS sponsored two events in recognition of it. The first was a mini symposium. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first was a mini symposium held on April 12th that showcased a group of junior investigators. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so it, it, it was held on April 12th, the Next Generation in Autism Research Mini Symposium. And it showcased a group of junior investigators, graduate students, and postdocs supported by NIEHS. Now, while the slide says next generation, I see uh, these um, very talented individuals as the current generation, you know, full of exciting new ideas. Uh, they presented research from a variety of disciplines, from epidemiology to laboratory-based mechanistic work uh, related to uh, autism. Next slide, please. NIEHS also hosted Dr. Diego Borges. Uh, he's assistant professor of gastroenterology and neurobiology at Duke University. And the title of his talk was Sugar, a Gut Choice. Dr. Borges' re recent work has involved the connection between gut and brain and its impact on nutrient sensing, eating, and other essential behaviors, and how these may be re re relevant to kids with autism who frequently cope with GI issues. He recently discovered that cells in the intestines form extensions similar to neurons and found that those extensions connect to nerve fibers in the gut, which relay signals to the vagus nerve and onward to the brain. He called these sensory cells of the gut neuropods. He found that those signal, signals reached the brain in milliseconds. Dr. Bojarquez is a recipient of an NIH Director's New Innovator Award, which he will use to study neuropods and the gut-brain connection in a mouse model of autism. Next slide, please. So next I'll talk about our environmental health disparities and environmental justice portfolio. Next slide. But first, I'd like to start with a few definitions. According to Healthy People 2020, a health disparity is defined as a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Racial and ethnic minority populations, low socioeconomic status populations, and rural and inner city populations are disproportionately burdened by many diseases and conditions resulting from health disparities. So NIH has expanded this definition as part of our strategic planning process to focus more specifically on environmental health disparities, which we define as uh, occurring as a result of the effects of stressors, including environmental over time, as well as exposures related to natural and man-made disasters on especially vulnerable communities when such exposures amplify or increase the existing health disparities in these communities. And then HHS also has offered a definition of environmental justice, um, which is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, natural, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Next slide, please. 
So efforts to identify and address uh, um, environmental health disparities often involve public health initiatives that focus on, you know, ameliorating the exposures or negative health outcomes rather than on the underlying causes of disparity. And I want to draw your um, attention to the fact that environmental health disparities are more likely to occur in vulnerable communities with lower SES, limited or no access to quality health care, uh, greater proximity to multiple sources of pollution. Uh, think about redlining, uh, ongoing and multiple exposures throughout the life course and limited health literacy and environmental uh, health literacy. So, uh, and, and in looking at these, it's really hard to disentangle these from uh, racial and uh, ethnic mi minority groups. Next slide, please. And this slide demonstrates the relationship between environmental justice action and environmental health disparities research. Uh, environmental justice action translates environmental health disparities research into practice to address inequities, including regulatory enforcement or policy change. Next slide. So over the past two decades, NIEHS has supported research programs, community engaged activities, and training and education uh, programs to address the disparate health impacts of environmental hazards on disadvantaged communities and ensure environmental health equity. And so the pinkish sort of lavenderish bars, I don't know what color that is, uh, represent our non-center programs and the sky blue uh, bars, or maybe that's teal, uh, represent our center programs. And as you can see, we have a long-standing history of working uh, in this area uh, with many of our uh, center and, and non-center programs with our worker education and training program being in, involved uh, in these efforts throughout. Uh, next slide, please. Our environmental health disparities, environmental justice portfolio is broken down into five grant type categories. And this slide shows the number of grants in each category over the past 10 years. Uh, these categories are not mutually exclusive. So uh, a grant and, and, and that exists in one category may uh, also exist in another category. And it's really hard to um, disentangle these. As you can see, the majority of the grants that we have supported over the last 10 years have been related to environmental justice and environmental health disparities, which I uh, provided uh, de definitions of earlier or earlier. Next slide, please. And so this word cloud shows the primary exposures and health outcomes addressed within our uh, environmental uh, uh, health disparities, environmental justice portfolio. The bigger the word, the greater number of projects addressing that topic area. And this shows that the number of grants from a sample of research topics on exposures and health outcomes. Um, and over the last decade, most projects have focused, not surprisingly, on air pollution and pesticide exposures, while outcomes have mainly been asthma and birth um, outcome related, and this is also over the last decade. Next slide, please. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the Centers of Excellence on Environmental Health Disparities Research Program. Uh, this is a collaborative effort supported by NIEHS, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and previously uh, by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and it encourages basic biological, clinical, epidemiologic, behavioral, and or social scientific investigations of disease con conditions that are known to be a significant burden in low socioeconomic and health disparate populations. And NIEHS currently funds three centers of excellence on environmental health disparities research on looking on the, the right hand um, side of um, this slide. Uh, focusing on the physical, built, and social environment, uh, community engagement and research, and investigator development. Next slide, please. 
And the three uh, centers that NIEHS supports are really diverse in, in terms of the topics that they address, uh, the geographic location, and the population studied. Uh, new in this round is the Baylor Center. Uh, the other two were focused, uh, were funded in previous rounds, but the Baylor Center is new and it focuses on maternal and infant uh, environmental health among African-American women. And its goal is to study the multi-level contributions from biology to the social and built environments to environmental health disparities in pregnant women and their infants. Next slide, please. This chart is based on uh, 235 active grants in our environmental uh, health disparities and environmental justice portfolio from 2011 to 2020. And you can see, I'd like to call your attention to um, 2020, where we see that we have a total of 235 active grants that we supported uh, over the last 10 years uh, focused uh, in uh, these areas of environmental health disparities and environmental justice uh, with the bulk of um, our grants uh, coming from the worker training program. Uh, next slide, please. So now I provide an overview of how um, environmental health sciences investigators are conducting experience to determine how interventions, including exposure reduction, education, and changes to the built environment can make individuals and communities healthier. And I'm gonna spend a little time on these because I think that these, uh, these are uh, important studies and it shows how we can, uh, what we can do to reduce exposure to harmful environmental exposures. Next slide, please. So I'll start with the home, air, and agriculture, the pediatric intervention or HAPPY trial. This um, study aims to reduce childhood asthma in Washington's rural Yakima Valley by combining asthma education and health assessments with air filters to reduce allergens in the home. The community has been involved with this at the outset and actually identified pediatric asthma as a research priority that in turn motivated this work. The study is led by Katherine Carr from the University of Washington and is funded through the NIEHS Research to Action Program. So the intervention includes 75 Latino children ages six to 12 years living within 800 meters of uh, agricultural operations who suffer from poorly controlled asthma for an in-home educational and air filtration intervention. The children were randomized to asthma educational program or into a group that included asthma education plus portable uh, HEPA NH3 air filters designed to reduce particles and ammonia. The cleaners were placed in the child's sleeping area and living room. Children in the education arm uh, only received the HEPA NH3 units after uh, the study year. So they were able to get the benefits uh, even, you know, they, they didn't participate in the intervention arm that provided these. So outcomes included samples of indoor air contaminants with PM 2.5 and uh, ammonia at baseline and one year follow-up. And then they also measured uh, ch child, okay, Gary, you can speak, child asthma health metrics at baseline. Uh, midpoint at four to six months and at one year. Uh, these included the asthma control test, the number of symptom days, clinical utilization, oral corticosteroid, oral corticosteroid use, pulmonary function, fractional excelled nitric oxide, et cetera. The team recently published results showing that at follow-up, families in the intervention group had 60% and 42% lower PM 2.5 in the sleeping and living area, respectively, compared to controls. Um, the investigators did not um, observe a reduction in ammonia. Next slide, please.
So this slide uh, focuses on an educational intervention, which was informed by results from research to examine the impacts of dietary components on cellular responses to uh, PCB exposure. Uh, researchers at the University of Kentucky Superfund Research Program Center discovered that polyphenols found in fruits, vegetables, and spices can protect against the harmful harmful effects of PCB exposure. So they took this uh, result and they designed an intervention designed to reduce the effects of these exposures. So specifically, these investigators reported that polyphenols uh, protect cells from damage such as oxidative stress and inflammation. They further discovered that diets rich in polyphenols can reduce the risk for PCB-associated type 2 diabetes in, in humans. And so building off their basic research, uh, they have been working to reduce the harmful effects of this exposure by educating the community and conducting nutritional interventions. Uh, the Center's uh, Community Engagement Corps has offered cooking classes that teach healthy behaviors as well as how to prepare fruits, fruits and vegetables and incorporate them into healthy meals. For example, the center researchers partnered with community-driven farmers market voucher and walking program to promote increased fruit and vegetable consumption and physical activity. A feasibility study demonstrated that providing $10 in farmers market vouchers was associated with significant improvements in health outcomes, fruit and vegetable consumption and knowledge. The Community Engagement Corps also developed a nine lesson curriculum and delivered it in four Kentucky counties. Pre and post lesson questionnaires revealed increased knowledge and awareness of the effects of environmental pollution on health and the protective role of dietary strategies. Focus group uh, participants self-reported positive behavior change, including eating more fruits and vegetables, reading food labels, and consuming fewer sugar sweetened drinks and fast food. Next slide, please. And in this example, uh, Sunset Park residents recognized that their community was extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change and took action to ensure that their safety following climate related events. events. And, and in other words, building resilience to better withstand future disasters. Uh, Sunset Park is a community in Brooklyn, New York, and is heavily industrialized with high poverty and unemployment rates. So the grassroots research to action in Sunset Park or GRASP was launched in response to widespread devastation following Superstorm Stan Sandy in 2012. Community members feared hurricane damage might release industrial chemicals and pollutants, contaminating residential and community spaces. The potential impacts of extreme weather events in Sunset Park are heightened by the disproportionate environmental burdens and social injustices that persist in the community. So one of GRASS research projects is an NIEHS research to action project uh, this project empowers residents and small business owners to address health risks associated with fugitive chemicals or hazardous chemicals that spread due to facility damage, storm surges, and flooding. And the project had um, several objectives and outcomes. Number one, it launched a new risk assessment framework that incorporates a community-based participatory research approach where community members uh, collect the data. The study will focus on automated repair and maintenance shops at Sunset Park. Community members also, uh, and auto shop owners conducted an inventory of shop chemicals, their vulnerability to release and potential health impacts. They then developed a toolbox and intervention to help small businesses implement practices aimed at containing chemicals during disasters, thereby helping protect the health in local community by reducing exposure to it. And this is a really good example of a community taking uh, responsibility and, um, and increasing its resilience uh, to these disasters. Next slide, please. And the final example 
of a community level research is the Green Heart Study. This is led by Aruni Bhatnagar at the University of Louisville. And this will assess whether increased residential vegetation improves health outcomes in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville's air quality ranks among the worst in the state and the city's tree canopy is also experiencing a steady decline. Uh, the research team will take baseline measurements of diabetes and heart disease risk, stress levels, and the strength of social ties in about 800 participants from targeted Louisville neighborhoods. They will also take baseline measurements of air pollution levels at the same time. And next, the team will plant thousands of trees and plants and shrubs throughout the neighborhoods. Participants will receive annual checkups to evaluate how uh, increasing greenery has affected their physical and mental health and social ties. And researchers will also compare the results to those from neighborhoods that did not receive the greening intervention. So this research is funded by NIEHS and in partnership with the Nature, Nature Conservancy, among other organizations that provided um, the trees and the shrubs. And so this is a good example of uh, pre and post uh, intervention. Next slide, please. All right. In addition to those uh, examples that I gave earlier, um, our division is also collaborating with other NIH institutes and centers that lead initiatives supporting, supporting health disparities research. And it's important that we work to together to leverage our resources across institutes where there are shared interests. For example, NIEHS collaborates with the National Institute of General Medical Sciences on the Native American Research Centers for Health and with the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities on understanding and addressing the impact of structural racism and discrimination on minority health and health disparities. Next slide, please. And of course, climate change is an environmental justice issue. Um, the president has stated this as a clear focus of his climate change agenda. Next slide, please. Dr. Wojcik discussed climate change during yesterday's session and the executive orders associated with it. And our division is meeting the challenge of the executive orders by addressing climate change and its effect on health in our research portfolio. I'd like to point out that Drs. Amy Boyles and Annika Zerlinga are heading up discussions within our division uh, uh, around climate change and, and, and the step forward. And Dr. Claudia Thompson will play a leading role on uh, NIH-wide activities related to climate change that Dr. Wojcik uh, discussed yesterday. Next slide, please. So the 2016 report on climate change and human health provides a detailed examination of climate drivers and their effects on health outcomes. This graphic shows a representation of how climate change affects health in the context of other environmental, institutional, and social behavioral factors. For example, increased temperatures can also exac exacerbate exposure to extreme heat, and poor air quality. And so in the context of poor housing infrastructure, lacking air conditioning and pre-existing health conditions, this could lead, lead to uh, poor health comes. And NIEHS has a deep history of working in climate change and health. As you can see in 2010, uh, we participated in a report that outlined research needs and provided a background from which to think about how we define climate change and, and health and provided some recommendations for research moving forward. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about our research portfolio uh, in climate change and human health. And so this is a preliminary um, look at our climate change portfolio and it covers fiscal years 2018 through 2020. Um, and you know, I, I might add, I'm talking a lot about our portfolio right now. Um, we are 
actually engaged in a larger portfolio and more detailed analysis of our portfolio and trends over time and, and the costs associated with you know, the types of research that we fund uh, over a period of time that we hope to have available um, for, for you to see uh, within uh, the next few councils. But right now, I just wanna give you a preliminary um, snapshot of, of what we're doing in specific areas like environmental health disparities, environmental justice, and also climate change. So these grants are managed by many program officers and fall under many award uh, uh, mechanisms. Awards have been made not only to US institutions, but also to, to researchers around the world. Uh, the most common research topics in the portfolio are weather-related events and dealing with asthma, allergies, and uh, airway health. Next slide, please. The portfolio also includes research on vulnerable communities. Of course, this is very important. Water and vector-borne exposures and heat-related effects. And while asthma is the most common health outcome across the portfolio, I, we see a theme here. It's the same with our uh, environmental health disparities, environmental justice portfolio. We also have grants examining cardiovascular disease and stroke, neurological effects, human development, mental health, cancer, and nutrition. Next slide, please. And there are a wide range of health exposures across the portfolio, but the predominant exposures include weather and climate change itself, air pollutants and infectious agents. Also included are mixtures, metals, and flame retardants, but these are, are less common uh, in the portfolio. Next slide, please. So I'd like to shift gears and talk a little bit about a specific initiative um, that actually has climate change in its title. Um, first led by Dr. Fred Tyson, the Oceans and Health, Human Health Centers is a longstanding collaboration between uh, NIEHS and the National Science Foundation. It began in 2004 and it pr promotes interdisciplinary cl collaborations between biomedical and ocean scientists. It develops novel tools and techniques and conducts multiple uh, research projects. This most recent launch of this initiative in 2016 placed climate change front and center with the purpose of supporting research on the exposures, toxicities, and human health impacts that arise in these environments and how climate, climate change is influencing these factors. There are currently four uh, PO1 centers, these are um, uh, uh, research project grants, and, our, and four R01s supported through this partnership. However, there are several more unsolicited research projects and fellowships related to this program currently supported by NIEHS. Pointing to the success of this program really and uh, stimulating uh, additional uh, research in this area. And I, I might add that um, Dr. Annika Zerlinga has uh, now taken uh, leadership of this uh, initiative for NIEHS. Next slide, please. So I, I want to talk about one example uh, from our portfolio in the Oceans and Human Health Program, which is at the University of South Carolina. And its focus is to assess the effects of climate change and other environmental factors on ocean health related microbial and harmful algal blooms, illness and disease. And it aims to develop better predictive forecasts and health prevention strategies that inform the public and reduce exposure, enhancing protection of public health. One important research aim is to model the health effects of climate change affected pathogen and pollutants such as microplastics, which could be harmful to our oceans, marine life, and human health. So this is a very important issue that um, this one particular um, project is, is handling. Next slide, please. 
So next I'll discuss NIEHS's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, specifically activities and progress to help create a more diverse environmental health sciences workforce. Next slide, please. Uh, so we've been doing um, a great deal of thinking and also developing initiatives around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion within the division. The Div division itself has created a diversity, equity, and inclusion working group that's de designed to coordinate activities uh, across the division and with others that are ongoing within NIEHS and, and NIH overall. And the focus will be on not only the extramural research um, community in terms of the types of research we support in terms of disparities, but also increasing you know, the diversity of the um, environmental health sciences workforce. Um, the other arm of it is also our internal workforce culture. Um, and, and, and so we see those things as, um, you know, working together because our certainly our, the diversity of our internal workforce culture can influence, you know, what we do with regard to um, the thinking around the initiatives that we develop and support for the extramural community. So we've already heard about research with funding and the environmental health disparities, environmental justice portfolio, which is a very important part um, of, of our efforts uh, with regard to DEI. So next I will introduce our efforts to create a more diverse environmental health sciences workforce. And these efforts in, include uh, diversity supplements going from left to right, um, the environmental health science extramural community engagement, and also the council working group. Um, next slide, please. So in February, we, we told you about efforts to increase the number of diversity supplement applications and corresponding number of awards and also to increase funding associated with it. We are also working on the, to, um, reducing the time to award. Um, this particular aspect we're not able to report on right now until the end of the fiscal year, but we'll sh uh, make sure to, to report uh, progress to you uh, in the coming months. But the purpose of the diversity supplements, um, just as a reminder, is to enhance the diversity of the research workforce by recruiting and supporting students, postdocs, and eligible investigators from diverse backgrounds including those from groups that have been shown to be underrepresented in health-related uh, research. Next slide, please. So these data show how we are making progress toward the first three goals shown on um, the previous slide. Uh, we have increased funding over the past several years, currently spending 3.3 million in fiscal year 21. And in, um, uh, fiscal year 21, we are also supporting 35 awards. And this is, uh, you know, the most that we have ever supported in, in one fiscal year. So we are just making outstanding uh, progress in, in, in that area. Um, some high level topics that we support through diversity of supplements include uh, public health, DNA repair, breast cancer, brain health, uh, exposures like endocrine, endocrine disrupting chemicals um, and as well as germ cells. Next slide. So this slide shows additional data about our diversity supplements. There have been 160 award recipients among 68 PIs and 80 institutions and these data are over the last 15 years. Uh, the five institutions Institutions shown here, you know, have supported five or more diversity supplement recipients. Um, the school up north, University of Michigan, University of Pittsburgh, Rutgers, Columbia, and Michigan State University. These all have supported five or more diversity supplement recipients. So that's more than the average of what we support um, across all institutions. 
So, and also um, the table on the bottom shows the breakdown of recipients by grant type. And most of the diversity supplements are through uh, R01, as you can see here. Um, but all of these other, um, the, the um, program project grants, the cooperative agreements, the center's grants, these are all eligible to submit a diversity supplement. Next slide, please. So what, what happens with uh, diversity supplements? Again, this is uh, uh, over a 15 year period. Um, diversity supplement award recipients, they largely stay in environmental health sciences and bio, uh, biomedical science, uh, more than 70%, which really highlights the success uh, of this program, at least I like to think it does. Um, and uh, there, the breakdown of other fields uh, is included below. Um, but I think this is a success story um, when, you know, when we can show that close to 40% um, stay in uh, environmental health sciences and another um, more than a third in uh, biomedical science in general. Next slide, please. And then diversity supplement award recipients largely stay in research, academia, and industry, nearly 65%. Uh, and the breakdown of other fields uh, is shown below. Again, this highlights, you know, um, there, we can't empirically, we haven't tested this empirically, but I'd like to think that, you know, the diversity supplements, these types of initiatives that we provide for um, you know, diversity supplement recipients actually help you know, with these numbers. 49% um, stay in uh, research and academia, and then another close to 15% uh, are in industry. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so um, here are community engagement goals and activities that are, um, DERT colleagues have been focusing on. Um, you know, some of the goals that I highlight include partnering with minority serving institutions. Um, an example of an activity supporting this goal includes planning listening sessions with HBCUs. And um, so I'll, I'll just, um, historically black co colleges and universities or HBCUs or other minority serving institutions. And this is relevant to the U and the UNITE uh, initiative that Dr. Wojcik spoke about yesterday, understanding stakeholder experiences through listening and learning. Um, and then intentional grantee engagement. Um, we expand the NIEHS website to focus more intentionally on DEI. And so this is in, in progress right now. We're, we're working on this. And this is also related to the T in UNITE, um, which is more about transparency, communication, accountability with both our internal and external stakeholders. So uh, the others include um, establishing a diversity supplement recipient network. So we're in the planning stages of bringing all of our diversity supplement recipients together and also promote a diverse and equitable and inclusive environmental health sciences communities. And so you can see um, the examples of some of these goals to the right. And I already discussed um, the planning involved with the ISEE workshop that's coming up. Next slide, please. And so finally, um, I won't go into detail about this, but you, you're all aware from Dr. Wojcik's talk yesterday, um, Dr. Vasquez is actually leading a multidisciplinary group uh, on what we're calling the NAEHS working group. This is the council working group that you have been hearing about focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these will um, you know, actually work on all of the issues that we've been talking about. So it's wide ranging. Um, and you'll hear 
more about this from Dr. Vasquez later um, today. And with that, I will stop. I think that's the end of my, my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I see a lot of things in the chat box. <laughs> So Gary, do you need help uh, going through the chats? I don't know, Pat, is that something you can help not with? Yeah, um, uh, Gary, why don't you take uh, Bob's question and then I'll read the chat when Bob when we answer Bob's question. We got some raised hands. Go ahead, Gary. Hi, hi Gary. Hi. Um, great talk. Uh, I just have a quick question. I noticed that NHLBI has a RFA out for G32s that promote diversity in training. Has NIHS considered a similar type of training grant? So, yeah, I, I noticed that as well. And these are all things that we are talking about and under consideration as we consider our efforts with diversity, equity, and inclusion overall. What, we, what can we do as an institute to enhance the diversity of our scientific workforce. I talked about diversity supplements, that's one way, but being more intentional about how we go about doing that could be another way. And so um, that's certainly something that we're willing to take under consideration. I'm going to, sorry, Terry had to put a uh, thing in the chat. So Terry, we'll skip over you, Karen, for a second. And Terry, let you ask your question. Thanks, Gary. Wonderful presentation. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering uh, if we might address the following um, concern. Uh, several years ago, we applied for a diversity supplement to the NIHS for uh, a student who wanted to do some training associated with our uh, core center, our P30 core center. And the NIH wide call for diversity supplements does include P30s but we were told that this was not the case at NIEHS. And I'm wondering if we might um, think about uh, doing that because there are unique opportunities that are provided by the course centers that uh, can provide some really great training, I think, for students and postdocs and other uh, people that might be interested in mentoring uh, in, in this way, including uh, community outreach and engagement, um, the uh, technical cores that are present at many of the centers provide uh, great opportunities for training. And then uh, our, our career mentees could really benefit, I think, by, with the additional support that might be provided through a diversity supplement. Yeah. Gary, can I kind of step in on that one? Maybe? Sure, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, um, and Christy, Pedro just kind of sent me an email, I mean, a, a chat here to let me know that we, we you're right, we haven't. Uh, awarded any diversity supplements to P30s. Um, I'm not aware that we have specifically not done that, Terry. I'd be curious as to who told you that, but um, if it's okay, I would like to uh, kind of take this as an offline thing and we'll look into it. Um, I'm not aware of any policy we have off the top of my head that says we can't do P30s. So, but, so thanks for raising that. And I will, uh, I will make a point here to we'll look into it and we'll get back to you. Thank yeah, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Right? It's certainly something we can look into. Yeah, yeah and I think P30s themselves are great opportunities for training, right? Just by the nature of, of, of the mechanism itself. One thing I, I wanted to mention, um, you know, I talked about the Autism um, Awareness Month activities. There were uh, several activities um, that happened around that time, taking a lot of coordination and I want to make sure that I recognize Astrid Hagen for her her um, hard work and and making sure that those things happen. So, Karen. Oh, thank you, Gary. That was so much information, and you presented it so smoothly and clearly. But it just I still can't wrap my head around it all. But I do. So I have a comment. It may or a question. It may be more philosophical, but I'm sure there you may have data to support this or not. But I wonder, so, you know, NIHS or any institute has a limited budget. And we talk about not just in diversity funding, but in general, we talk about, do we want more 
grants or larger? So you were talking about how some of them were, you were providing more funding for those. And of course, if you provide more funding for one, then that means fewer overall people are funded. And I wonder what is the right balance there. And I say this because I know the ONES program, for example, has been very successful. Um, several of the ONES awardees, one is a, in my division, is, is one of our faculty that we brought in, um, and many of my friends and colleagues. So I know that it's been very successful. It's outstanding scientists get those, and it, it really promotes their career. But on the other hand, they get a little confused when the ONES runs out, because it's really almost more like an R01 and a half. And so then do they go to an R01 and an R21? Do they do two R01s? But they're sort of junior, so they don't quite know how to make that split. And there are some issues there about but, um, salaries on ones and K awards that make it complicated for new faculty. I do wonder where, and this is a whole other conversation, but it's important because you brought this up. When is it beneficial to actually increase budgets versus increase numbers of awards? Do you have any just philosophical response or data backed up data response on that? So <laughs> I'm glad you you uh, brought that up, uh, in particular the, the data part, because I think that that's going to be an important piece for helping us answer these very important questions, right? Um, you know, I mentioned the portfolio analysis, understanding what we support and the trends and what we're supporting. You know, the, the programs that we've been supporting, longstanding programs, um, and actually evaluating that, that's going to be important in helping us make decisions about what to support moving forward. So I don't have a direct answer to your question. I think that it does need to be backed up by data, what's like most efficient, what's most important. Um, and, and sometimes, yeah, you know, I, I can say that um, you know, sometimes we don't have a choice when we get a mandate from, you know, the executive office. So, so those are, you know, other issues that that we'll have to deal with. But what's within our control in terms of what we support, who we support, what are the trends over time? We need to take a look at that to help us make some really tough decisions. Yeah, it would be it would be quite interesting, but you know, maybe putting more people in the workforce, but then maybe they're not as well prepared as just fewer that are more strongly support. It's just really a difficult thing, but it's really um, it's great that you'll be able to obtain data on that to actually consider those things moving forward because it is really complex. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thank you for that question. Gary, if, if it's okay for me to just chime in here for a second. Sure. Uh, as the new director of NIEHS, you know, I've, I've been working with Gary to put together that portfolio analysis. And Karen, you're, you're absolutely correct. That we, we don't have an unlimited budget. And so you know, creating some data around where do we actually spend our money. And you know, we've also been talking about uh, program project grants. Um, and you know, how do we fit all of these things in so that we can actually uh, very deliberately fund you know, different things that uh, that you know, are consistent with what we want to be funding, uh, and how do we distribute the money in a way that's that uh, you know, giving us more bang for the buck, and we're we're making sure that we're providing support for you know, early stage investigators, and so you know, getting a better sense of where is the money going currently. You know, that's a very complicated question, and Gary has been working very diligently, and he's got some terrific staff in DERT. Uh, to you know, pull this together. So we'll we'll be looking at this and, yeah. and we may have to make some tough decisions. About yeah, it will be interesting to see the, the data, the numbers as it comes out. And it's also, Gary, you know, you mentioned about trainees and then how they go on or early junior faculty and, you know, their, their career trajectory and success. That's also, it's a little less, um, it's a little less data gathering in a sense, because there are many factors that go into that, but clearly the funding is involved. So I think seeing where they go and how they do and which provides the most impact. You know, sometimes PO1s, for example, it takes a lot of money, but it also is very impactful sometimes because as a, in part of a PO1, we've been able to produce more pa papers and pr product, if you will. So it's a really, really challenging question, but I think it's so key, especially like anybody with a budget, right? You, you have to do that. But I would look forward to hearing those the reports on that. 
Thank we'll you. Keep, we'll keep cranking. Thanks, away Karen. And uh, we'll update you as the, the data it begins to roll in. So thanks for that question. I think Jalan was the next one up there. Here. Yeah, um, thanks so much. And Hi, thanks, Karen, for the Good morning, good morning. Um, I'm all go blue, go green. Both of my family went to Michigan State and U of M, so I'm like go teal with all these comments in the comment box. Uh, you, um, you know I'm a Buckeye, right? All right, well, I was born in Lyme, Ohio, so okay. it's all good. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, two quick questions. Um, one is you had a slide that was talking about a lot of the, I guess the topic areas that are covered in, in many of the grants. And I'm just wondering from you and your team, are there any like one or two research topics that you think should be covered more or um, are missing and are definitely in need of kind of research focus. So, so that's one question. And then the second question, and this is maybe a little bit of my unfamiliarity, but I really appreciated the case study around nutrition and how that extended to like nutrition classes and actually something operationalized in the community. And I'm wondering, um, is there any mechanism or like something in place with these grant programs that pushes that operationalization of data. So it's not just data kind of, you know, kind of understanding what's wrong, but it actually is data that's used to deal with some of the systemic injustices and in infrastructures that um, are kind of contributing to that problem. So is that kind of a focus or uh, uh, I guess a part of the grants as well as they're you know, kind of just getting data, but how that's being used. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, so so the first part of your question um, around, you know, um, exposures and things that uh, we like to see um, funded in the future. We had a great talk yesterday around the expo zone. Um, and I think that you know, what, what that covers is multiple exposures and its effect on health and how do we integrate those. And so uh, I'm really interested in, in seeing more of that and how that goes, but I'm really interested in what your thoughts are around, you know, given the presentation that I showed and what we're supporting and the types of exposures, what what you think might be missing there. Um, and we, we rely on the advisory group for that. So I'm interested in, in hearing your thoughts. I'm seeing some things also from the chat that, um, you know, uh, from, from Dr. Tyson who uh, oversees or, or who did oversee our uh, Oceans and Health program um, mentioning sea level change and climate change refugees with respect to mental health outcomes. I think that is an important consideration. Um, and so anyway, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. John. Yeah, no, I mean, that's great. I mean, definitely, you know, there's, I have tons of ideas, <laughs> so I can definitely share that offline. I just, please, yeah. There was something that that came up for you and your team that you haven't seen more of um, that we could help cultivate. Um, so that's cool. Um, and then the second part. Yeah, I mean, basically, is there something within the grant mechanism that allows the data and the findings to be operationalized to address some of the systemic and kind of institutional root cause issues of what we're seeing in terms of health disparities. So how are oftentimes, you know, communities, the data is collected, you kind of verify what's wrong. You already know kind of what's jacked up. How is that yeah. kind of, is there some impetus or mechanism that actually extends the use of that data yeah. to, yeah. Yeah. you know, hopefully yeah. you're getting it. Yeah, so, so one, one of our um, initiatives is the research to action, right? And I described one of um, the uh, projects within that where the investigators um, saw that um, you know polyphenols were related to, to reducing the effects of PCB exposure, and they used those data to create interventions designed to you know increase the use of fruits and vegetables among you know populations who might have been exposed. Um, you know, to, to that chemical. And so I think that that's one example um, of, 
you know, what we do with regard to the data that we collect and how it could be used to ameliorate um, some of the exposures that we see. The other thing that is, I think is really unique about NIEHS is that it has a community engagement core. It's a requirement for all of its centers. Um, and the community uh, is engaged. I mean, exactly what the name implies with the, the researchers and they are, um, those, the community uh, is involved from the very beginning. They help shape the research. They actually translate the research to their communities. Um, so I think that that's also an, an important aspect. And again, I'd be interested in, in um, hearing more of your thoughts about that. And I think that Katrina has a comment and uh, related to that, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so actually, you just gave me a, a idea for where to start my comment, which is I think we have a great and very timely opportunity to evaluate the research to action program. So what you've presented is an incredible analysis. And as a qualitative researcher, I think I have a bit of a sense of how much work has gone into what you shared today. It was an incredible piece of research. And I'm just astounded at what your staff were able to accomplish in a few short months. Um, and the next step you know, with this kind of qualitative research is, is interpretation. So sharing back that coding and the summaries to try to make meaning of them with the people who um, produce them and are affected by it. So um, I'd love it if you know those share, particularly the slides that you had on environmental health disparities and environmental justice, and maybe also the climate portfolio could be shared with the CEC cores and the PEPH um, group and ask them what, what they think of it. Because you know, you've presented a topical analysis of what has been funded. And the, my favorite question is always, so what? So what is it that we've accomplished with this funding? Um, and how can we evaluate over a time. So we've had um, topics, but what are their impacts? And those are much harder to measure. So thinking about how to evaluate that um, is important. So one other small comment was you had a slide about community engagement in, and most of those issues or those um, bullets that you had there seem to me also in the bailiwick of um, workforce development and um, diversity of workforce. And I think that the community engagement cores and research to action researchers might define that bucket differently. So um, um, it, it really begs the question of what is our goal of community engagement with respect to DEI and vice versa. You know, we've talked a lot about workforce, but also understanding environmental health disparities and also environmental justice problem solving and getting back to Jalan's first point. Um, how can we better engage communities in setting the research agenda, not just with respect to topics to study, but also the types of research and the outcomes we want, and how does that information get used? So thank you. I, Katrina, I was just kind of, um, thanks for that the point, especially about the, the different kind of trainees that we're for the community research. And I think that is something that the working group should, should tackle. I'm looking at you, Karen, right now. So something that we can put on the agenda to tackle. Um, Gary, Bob had a, right, had a question with the new climate and health funding in the 2022 budget, if approved, big caveat, include work addressing environmental justice. Did you want to address that? Or is that is that a Rick question? Would you repeat it? Sorry. Yeah, it says, will the new climate and health funding in the 2022 budget include work addressing envir environmental justice? I mean, I think the answer is obviously yeah, yes, yeah. but if, if, yeah. if, if either of you like to expound on that, that would be. So it's it's actually what, what I, I hope to have accomplished yesterday was to point out that the the Biden administration focus on you know climate change is all within a framework of uh, environmental justice and just making sure the you know the you know tribal communities and other uh, minority communities benefit uh notably from the investments that are made in addressing climate change so you know pat i th you know, i think the kind of the bottom line is that environmental Oops. justice is overlaid on top of the the whole topic area of climate change and i think that this uh, very nicely integrates with some of the uh the thoughts and plans that are emerging from other ic directors i mean for example with josh uh, gordon at nimh i know that there's a, a great deal of interest in understanding the you know the effects of of mental health and stress within uh, different you know, communities so 
Yeah, so environmental justice plays a really big role in this. Is that is that what you were asking? It was Bob's question. I, Bob, is that, does that get to what yes, you were that, asking? Yes, that, that, that addresses it. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So, Pat, we are out of time for this yeah, segment. I would just, yeah, we are, and I would just mention um, that Gwen put a, um, a web, I'm sorry, no, a link to the um, research, to, research action. to action in chat. And um, so please make sure you read through those. So back to you, Gary. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm happy to um, chat with any of you offline if there are any additional questions or comments. Um, and so uh, I'll turn it over to Rick. Sounds good. Okay, I don't have the agenda in front of me. So Gary, help me so, out. So the, the, the next talk is uh, Matt Gilman. Okay. So then it's my pleasure. So do we have, yeah, Matt is here. Great. Good to see you, Matt. Good afternoon. And thank you for Hi, your willingness to give a presentation at our council. So I will spend just a couple of minutes here and in introducing all of you to Dr. Gilman. So he joined the National Institutes of Health in 2016 as the inaugural director of the Environmental Influences, uh, Influences on Child Health Outcomes, the ECHO program. And this is within the office of the director of the NIH. Uh, so he joined NIH from the Harvard Medical School where he was a professor of population medicine and nutrition in the Harvard School of Public Health. So his background is in the fields of epidemiology, pediatrics and internal medicine. Uh, he came to the NIH with experience in leading and collaborating on large cohort and clinical trials. So he received his bachelor's degree from Harvard, earned a medical degree from Duke, um, completed his uh, med peds residency at North Carolina Memorial Hospital, and received a master's degree in epidemiology from Harvard School of Public Health. So I can't imagine anyone who is more qualified to be providing leadership to the ECHO program. And I can just say, personally say that Matt has just been a real pleasure to work with. And um, We've got a lot of common interests, so I, I look forward to actually continuing to try to explore your different avenues where we can be uh, very effectively collaborating with uh, the ECHO program. So Matt, I'll turn the virtual platform back over to you. Thanks so much, and thanks for this opportunity to speak to the council. It's great to see some old friends and meet new ones to talk today about early physical and chemical influences on child health outcomes. In the ECHO program, ECHO stands for Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes. And as Rick said, it's in the office of the director. So today I'd like to tell you a little bit about ECHO and the ECHO-wide cohort, then dive into three examples of ECHO science where we're trying to develop an evidence base for policy and programs. One is on phthalates and neurodevelopment. Uh, one is on PFAS and obesity and dysmetabolism. And then some comments about geocoding with air pollution and respiratory outcomes as an example. Throughout, I'll highlight some cross-cutting uh, issues. Um, I want to highlight the support from the Human Health Exposure Analysis Resource, or HERE, uh, co-funded by ECHO and run by NIEHS. We have our Opportunities Infrastructure Fund, which is to support junior investigators for innovative research. We have our diversity supplements to support workforce diversity, and I'll talk about future opportunities and then leave time for discussion and questions. So before I get started, I have special thanks for our collaborations with NIEHS, including Rick and the former director, Linda Birnbaum, who have offered great support throughout, as well as other staff um, in programs and with the HERE resource. And as you'll see, as I go through, many of the ECHO cohorts have also been funded for, um, for synergistic or complementary aims uh, through NIEHS. The ECHO mission is to enhance the health of children for generations to come. And we carry out the, this mission with a view that a good start to life can last a lifetime and over generations. And this is the purview of what's been known as developmental origins of health and disease or DOHAD. And DOHAD posits that early exposures, perturbations or cues or events may have effects that are long lasting, uh, even lifetime and sometimes irreversible through what's called programming, for example, via epigenetics. And we recognize that development is a highly integrated process 
and can offer sensitive or critical times for exposure because of rapid growth, because of active and extensive cell differentiation, increased metabolic rates, and the developing immune system. So to ensure the good start that we're talking about, we need to understand potential risks and resilience factors, whether they be diseases that occur or things that are appear on our shelves or unhealthful or healthful habits. We need to understand when and to whom they apply and then take action through programs, policies, and practices uh, to improve our kids' health. And I mentioned clinical trials because ECHO is a nationwide program that uh, includes both observational and intervention research. The intervention research is through the Idea States Pediatric Clinical Trials Network. But today we'll focus most on the, mostly on the observational side, which is our ECHO cohorts. The overall scientific goal of the cohorts is to answer solution-oriented questions about effects of a broad range of early environmental exposures on child health and development. And by a broad range of the early environmental exposures, we think of things that range from society to biology, including our physical and chemical exposures. Somewhat arbitrarily, we define our exposure period as conception to age five. And we look at health outcomes from birth through adolescence in these five areas, pre, peri, and postnatal outcomes, upper and lower airway conditions, obesity and dysmetabolism, the many facets of neurodevelopment, and positive health or well-being. One of our major goals on the observational side <clears throat> is to create a data platform we're calling the Echo White Cohort which weaves together data from 72 ongoing maternal child cohort studies. So to address research questions that no single cohort can answer alone, because it involves 50,000 plus children and their families from diverse populations. And the idea is to become a nationwide research resource by establishing this data platform that consists of harmonized existing measures and standardized new measures in concert with our common data collection protocol, which is publicly available. Now the echo wide cohort <clears throat> is not uh, only consisting of the cohorts themselves, but also several cores and centers that support its work, including here. We're about four and a half years into echo and I can report that on the echo wide data platform so far, we have data from over 90,000 participants. That includes 57,000 plus children, plus mothers and a few fathers. 22 of the 22,000 are in active follow-up and that number is growing. We have uh, 26,000 plus biospecimens collected from about 13,000 participants. And our population is diverse in age, socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, and geography. Here you can see in terms of race, ethnicity, it's 45% non-Hispanic white, 13% non-Hispanic black, and 25% Hispanic. Our ECHO investigators have been busy uh, publishing uh, more than 650 papers uh, so far. Most of these have been from single cohorts or collaborations um, established outside the data platform. We have 27 ECHO-wide cohort publications so far. Um, so most of what I'm gonna tell you about is from those single cohort or collaborations that have been occurring since the beginning of the program. So let's first uh, delve into prenatal phthalates and child neurodevelopment. As most of you know, phthalates are ubiquitous chemicals. They make our plastic soft and flexible. They consist of older chemicals that are being phased out and newer or replacement ones. Many are metabolized and either the parent or the, uh, the compound or the metabolite is measurable in urine, and they act as endocrine disruptors. Now recently there have been calls for more regulation based on the neurotoxicity of early exposure to phthalates. Um, I do wanna point out though that um, much, of these, much of the evidence base is based on animal studies, and we need uh, much more in the way of human studies. And part of the reason I say that is that when you look at meta-analyses um, recently published, they don't necessarily show associations of phthalates 
with neurodevelopmental outcomes. Here's an example looking at five prenatal phthalates with child cognition up to age four years, showing for these five phthalates, the pooled estimates are really right about the null. On the other hand, the level of confidence in these findings is not high. And this is for cognition and other neurodevelopmental outcomes such as motor beh uh, behavior, including infant and social behavior. <clears throat> and as you can see in this summary, the authors gauge the level of confidence is either slight or indeterminate for almost all of these particular phthalates and these outcomes. Some of the limitations of the studies to date include exposure misclassification. Since these are non-persistent chemicals, if you measure it once, you might not be looking at the usual exposure. Um, related to that, there might be periods of heightened susceptibility. We talked about uh, potential sensitive or critical periods. And typically they've been measured in late pregnancy, not earlier. There's been a lack of information on sex specific effects. The concentration on single chemicals rather than phthalate mixtures to which many are exposed and the phthalates are correlated with each other. And again, many of the studies are with shorter term intermediate endpoints and there's a need for longer follow-up, repeated exposure assessment and larger sample size for clinical diagnoses. So how have uh, ECHO cohorts been addressing these challenges so far? One example is the Illinois Kids Study. Um, in this study, the uh, investigators collected first morning urine at five different time points during gestation. And for this analysis, they pooled the samples across pregnancy into a single sample. The outcome here was the visual recognition memory paradigm at 7.5 months, which is about information processing and is related to later cognitive outcomes in children. And as you can see on the left-hand side, they showed that the sum of the anti-androgenic phthalates was associated with the longer looking time, especially in males. This is the same cohort, but looking at a cognitive task, again, a visual task at 4.5 months, a little bit earlier than seven and a half months of age. And in this particular analysis, they not only looked at a pooled sample, as you see on the right, but also looked at a particular time point, 16 to 18 weeks gestation. Now, the pattern of the relationships with the different phthalates in this outcome, you can see, is pretty similar across whether it's a pooled sample or a specific time point. And I do want to point out that in this particular study, the sum of the AA phthalates was not related to uh, the outcome in boys or girls, suggesting that we need uh, more studies like where um, the ECHO wide cohort data platform will offer. Now, this particular study is not about a neurodevelopmental uh, outcome, but about a perinatal outcome, preterm birth. This is from the PROTECT cohort in Puerto Rico, also co-funded by NIEHS. And I show this one because there is evidence here of a critical period, because higher urine concentrations of certain phthalates at 24 weeks in the green circles V2, but not at 20 or 28 weeks earlier or later, was related to increased risk of preterm birth for these four phthalates. Showing the PROTECT uh, study also gives me an opportunity to demonstrate our commitment to uh, developing uh, workforce diversity. So in 2020, we were able to award uh, eight diversity supplements, including this one to Dr. Cardona Cordero, who works in the PROTECT study, um, whose goal is to inform women about ways to reduce or eliminate exposures to phthalate containing consumer products by looking at the relationships between use of these products and phthalate concentrations. We also plan to, uh, um, to award uh, diversity supplements in 2021. I meant mentioned mixture analyses. Um, here is uh, some evidence from the CANDLE study, another cohort study within ECHO, using um, a mixture approach called weighted quantile sum regression with an additional feature called the permutation test which makes the p-values a little more conservative. And in this particular study, you see largely null associations of third trimester urine phthalate with language scores at age three, 
or with the full scale IQ or cognitive scores at age four to six. And indeed, uh, the only um, association that pops out here is one that is actually anti the hypothesis that they came in with. Um, here's looking at uh, potentially a clinical outcome, autism spectrum disorder in two cohorts, marbles, which is a high risk cohort and arch, which is a low risk cohort. In marbles, looking at either the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder or typical or non-typical development. And in arch, looking at the social responsiveness scale, which is a continuous scale of social responsiveness which underlies one of the constructs within the autism spectrum disorder uh, clinical spectrum. And you can see there is a hint both in the marbles and in the arch that monoethyl phthalate might be associated with outcomes. In the marble study, looking at not the autism spectrum disorder outcome, but the non-typical development versus typical development. And in the arch cohort in a smaller sample, looking at the SRS, the social responsiveness scale in males only. So I would say that uh, so far we've seen that single cohort analyses have shown quite a bit of variation associations between prenatal phthalates and offspring neurodevelopment, which we think is important for the evidence base to drive policy and programs. The echo-wide cohort offers sample size and diversity as I've shown, along with harmonized exposure data, we've talked about timing, including newer and older chemicals, harmonized outcome data, and an analytic framework that can take uh, both a single chemical approach as well as a mixtures approach. Um, phthalates are one of the uh, um, high priority chemical classes for echo-wide cohort analyses that our investigators have shown because they're either existing or planned assays within our cohorts. And um, there are a number of analyses in progress in the echo-wide cohort that look at early effects of phthalates on outcomes, including birth outcomes like fetal and postnatal growth, gender incongruence, looking at communication from birth to three years, associations with infant electrocortical parameters in the nursery, um, ADHD, and again, autism spectrum disorder. Now, I mentioned harmonized exposure measures. Um, one of the key elements here is our collaboration with the HERE resource. Um, HERE exists to advance understanding of the impact of environmental exposures on human health throughout the life course. And of course, ECHO is interested in the earlier stages of this life course. The HERE laboratory network consists of three labs looking at target analysis of biosamples two looking at untargeted, and one of environmental samples. And within ECHO, we're um, collaborating with those labs that are looking at targeted and untargeted analysis of biosamples. And we funded um, a number of assays, as you'll see, as well as some upfront work about validation. Now, um, there's this famous quote by Donald Rumsfeld, there are known knowns, and that's pretty much what I've shown, shown you so far about known phthalates. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. And this allows me to highlight some work that has been done by one of the HERE labs to create a multi-class chemical panel of 121 biomarkers. And this reflects the fact that standard assays, for example, in NHANES, don't include many of the novel or replacement exposures. In addition, most panels focus on one class of chemicals. So in this novel chemical panel with just 0.5 mils of urine, one can detect multiple classes and both replacement and legacy chemicals. And this particular panel includes 45 phthalate metabolites and other plasticizers, 45 phenols and 31 pesticides. Currently, um, ECHO uh, has a pilot study among 171 pregnant women from the nine ECHO cohorts you see in this table. And this is a collaboration with the Wadsworth Hair Lab to measure these 121 chemicals along with aromatic amines. And you can see that these nine cohorts uh, are from across the US and do capture geographic, temporal, and sociodemographic diversity. 
Preliminary data to date suggests that 56 chemicals are detected in more than half of the pregnancy urine samples. And you can see in the blue box on the right, frequently detected chemicals, including 18 phthalates and alternative plasticizers. Next up in this line of work is a full-scale study of prenatal novical chemical exposures and pre, peri, and postnatal outcomes. So the idea would be to quantify these chemical exposures for 6,000 plus pregnant women from 21 cohorts using this here assay to investigate the associations with lower birth weight, preterm birth, and falls for gestational age, and to conduct a sub-study with repeated samples during pregnancy to understand within-person variability. And after this, we have the opportunity to look at these exposures with our neurodevelopment and the other child health outcomes. I want to mention that this novel chemical panel uh, among the 6,000 plus participants is part of creating an echo exposome database. And here you see a number of these chemicals that are going to be part of this database and when the data are expected to be populated. Well, coming back to the Donald Rumsfeld quote, the rest of the quote is, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know, we don't know. And that allows me to highlight some work done on untargeted analyses here in the Chemicals in Our Bodies study, another ECHO cohort that is co-funded by NIEHS, in which they've characterized the chemical exposome of industrial chemicals in matched maternal and core blood sample pairs, 60 of them, um, using an untargeted analysis approach. And you can see they were able to detect 3,500 chemicals in these samples, including those with annotated compounds on the left-hand side and those not previously reported in human exposures on the right-hand side, including many unknowns. And this is <clears throat> one of the frontiers, I think, of exposure science in ECHO. And I think we heard some, uh, some words about this yesterday in the exposome talks. Um, untargeted analyses is, again, another part of creating this ECHO exposome database. Now, let me say a few words about prenatal PFAS and child obesity and metabolism. Well, it seemed like a good idea then. Uh, PFO and PFAS are really good at repelling dirt, grease, water, and stains. But uh, US manufacturers now have voluntarily phased out these, but then replaced them with other chemicals. And so it's still <clears throat> really important for us to understand control and prevent untoward exposure to PFAS. These chemicals like phthalates are ubiquitous, but these are persistent and bioaccumulative and they are present in placenta and cord blood. So it appears that PFAS in varying quantities do cross the placenta from mother to fetus. <clears throat> Both older long chain PFAS like PFO and PFAS and newer shorter, change, uh, shorter chain PFAS may influence offspring weight and metabolism via similar mechanisms. And you can see from this title on the left-hand side from some ECHO investigators, perhaps through PPARs in the placenta itself. Um, <clears throat> the evidence uh, for prenatal PFAS and offspring obesity or dysmetabolism uh, outside of ECHO in human populations is somewhat scant and only suggestive. Um, and much of this research has been done outside the US, suggesting that we need uh, more studies like we can get from the ECHO-wide cohort to look at this area. So what's been done within single ECHO cohorts to date? This is a cohort called Healthy Start. I looked at sex specific associations of prenatal PFAS concentrations with uh, uh, PPOD, which is an air displacement method of looking at body fat at five months of age. And you can see here that in these sex specific uh, uh, analyses that PFNA and PFOA looked as though they conferred um, higher risk of or higher amounts of uh, percent fat in the males, but maybe a diminution in relation to PFOS in the females. Another cohort, which um, I was actually involved with for many years, uh, Project Viva, also co-funded by NIEHS, looked at prenatal PFAS with mid-child adiposity 
and with metabolism. And in the first study, uh, prenatal PFAS was associated with small increases in adiposity in the child, but only among girls. However, there was no evidence for an adverse effect of early life PFAS exposure on metabolic function in mid-childhood. And in fact, in cross-sectional studies, higher PFAS concentration had lower insulin resistance as an association. So again, I think there's a call for looking at this in larger and more diverse populations. And I'm glad to say that there are echo-wide cohort analyses in progress with PFAS, I'm looking at the right-hand column with regard to birth outcomes, with regard to metabolic health and with regard to physical growth and obesity, covering several cohorts. Um, like the other chemicals that I showed, PFAS is uh, uh, one of the chemical classes that's the, uh, within the ECHO exposome database being constructed right now. And again, we hope that this exposome database will be available uh, at first to ECHO investigators, but then to the wider, broader scientific audience for a number of analyses relating early life uh, chemicals to child health outcomes. Okay, in my final uh, example, let me talk about geospatial approaches using air pollution and airways outcomes as an example. So when we think about uh, using geomarker data for place-based exposures, what we think about is gathering addresses, geocoding them, converting the addresses to coordinates, and then linking them to geomarker data. So that might be spatial locations that have environmental or census or electronic medical record data. And more to the point in longitudinal studies, we collect addresses and dates and then construct individual residential timelines, which we can then assign exposures to. So within ECHO, um, we aim to define context and space and time for all our ECHO participants, as many as possible, by geocoding addresses and constructing these residential timelines, and then applying data resources. And already within the analysis workbench at the ECHO Data Analysis Center, we have a number of resources from the EPA, CDC, Department of Transportation, HRSA, land use databases, the census, and ESRI, which is the home of ArcGIS. I'd also like to highlight that a number of our Opportunity Infrastructure, OIF, recipients are working on projects related to geocoding. One is a novel uh, privacy-sparing approach to uh, a number of geocoding uh, applications by Cole Brokamp. Both Peter James and Alan Just are looking at measures of greenness. And I'll highlight some work that Alan Just is doing with air pollution and temperature models. And the idea through these resources, whether they're existing resources or novel resources, is to conduct echo-wide cohort science. So geocoding in echo includes at every freeze or lock of the database, which occurs every six months. And our data analysis center does the yeoman's work of doing the geocoding. As of January 31st, uh, we had geocoded 29,773 unique addresses from over 60,000 records. And as you can see, uh, over 90% were geocoded either at a very good or an excellent level. And this has allowed our geospatial working group along with our data analysis center to construct these residential timelines from uh, so far over 17,000 uh, unique IDs from 53 cohorts representing over 1.5 million person months covering a time period from 1994 to 2021. And you can see from the frequency distribution, most of those are in the more recent years. This slide shows the individual cohorts that contribute these timeline data. Um, these are uh, divided arbitrarily into two halves, left and right. And each cohort is represented by a color. And you can see that some of the cohorts have contributed data from long ago and some from more recently and some at single time points and some at multiple time points. And with that, we uh, can create these residential timeline density graphs across year and age. This particular one uh, covers a 25% random subset from these over 17,000 participants. Here, gray indicates the pre uh, pregnancy period and blue to red to yellow indicates an increasing child's age postnatally. 
So there are a number of opportunities for these geospatial data within ECHO um, to answer life course epidemiology questions. We've mentioned critical windows of exposure and longitude analyses. I'll show you an example of a distributed lag model. They'll look at joint effects of social stressors and environmental exposures, an example of health disparities research. To develop methods, for example, to deconstruct spatial and temporal correlations. Um, to look at multivariate patterns and exposures, that is mixtures. To incorporate knowledge about spatial relationships in analyses, such as walking distance or neighborhood density. And understanding and accounting for spatial clustering. And a number of exposures are possible. A lot of the work has been done on air pollution so far. And that includes this work by our OIF recipient, Alan Just, who has uh, applied a machine learning prediction model to reconstruct ambient exposures each day from 2003 to 2020, which includes both uh, 24 hour PM 2.5, as well as temperature. And these data are available for, uh, across the continental USA using privacy protected exact latitude and longitude and capture things like near roadway exposures. The models are designed to stay up to date and um, they're, um, they're close to being operationalized within our data analysis center. Among all the analysis proposals that are going through the pipeline, which use the geospatial component, a plurality do uh, apply to air pollution. So that gives me an opportunity here near the end of my talk to talk about air pollution and airways outcomes and ask the question, are there critical windows for this exposure? And here you can see a cartoon of the development of the airways. Um, the, ex the gas exchange area is really developed in these uh, later periods, the saccular and alveolar periods, as you can see blown up here on the right-hand side. So the question of one of our cohorts was what about these fetal lung development phases? Is there a particular phase where maternal exposure to PM 2.5 during pregnancy confers elevated asthma risk in early childhood? And from the Pathways uh, study, which is actually a combination of two ECHO cohorts with about 1,500 participants, you can see whether looking at the uh, outcome of ever asthma or current wheeze or current asthma in four-year-olds, that mid to late pregnancy exposure to 2.5 was the exposure period associated with these outcomes, as you can see in the circles. Now, research to date on outdoor air pollution and early life respiratory outcomes has largely involved criteria pollutants. The criteria pollutants are those routinely monitored to assess air quality. We've talked about particulate matter less than 2.5 micro, micrometers. Um, there are also the PM10s, which are larger than those, and the nitrogen compounds. However, it may be true that ultrafine particles, those less than 0.1 micrometers, may have enhanced toxicity because of larger surface area to mass ratio, enhanced oxidative capacity, deeper lung penetration, or ability to translocate to the systemic circulation. So these aren't available from the satellite images yet, but they are available from ground monitors in certain areas. And in the access and prism cohorts, which are in two areas in the Boston area, investigators were uh, able to show that ultrafine particle exposure in pregnancy, these are cumulative effects across pregnancy, um, were associated with about a four to five um, fold increase in odds per doubling of um, ultrafine particle exposure. I think one of the interesting things about this study is they were also able to look at these critical periods using this distributed lag model and suggested that indeed it's this later part in pregnancy that might be the exposure vulnerability window to ultrafine particles in relation to children's asthma risk. So that's my last example. And I just wanted to conclude by saying that ECHO is a major investment in understanding how early environmental factors may influence child health through longitudinal data and biospecimen assays. There's a major emphasis on chemicals and air pollution and other geospatial factors, 
and looking at the relationship between those and our five key pediatric outcomes. I th I've shown you today that single cohort findings are starting to fill in the evidence gaps on long-term inflows on phthalates and PFAS, et cetera. And soon we'll have data from the ECHO-wide cohort data platform, which includes a greater sample size, diversity, and generalizability. And just wanted to emphasize again how much we rely on the HERE resource to provide evidence for legacy and novel chemicals. So thanks very much. Before I end uh, and answer questions, I'd like to invite you to join us for our workshop on preconceptional origins of child health outcomes, which are hosting on June 17th and 18th. And you can find details at our uh, public facing website, echochildren.org. And also you're welcome to respond to our request for information on enhancing the science for ECHO program. Here you can see the link and the um, com comments are due on June 8th. So thanks very much for this opportunity and I'm happy to answer questions or get into discussion. Matt, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, and so we'll make sure that we get that link to everyone. everyone. If you have it um, available, uh, you can put it in the chat um, so that uh, folks on the call can access it. I will, as soon as we're done. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for questions before our break. Um, and I see that Bob has raised his hand. Bob? I feel like I'm always first. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bob. Hi, Matt. How are you? It's good to see you again. Um, a few years back, there was some talk on the executive committee about uh, once there's a data uh, echo-wide platform that didn't exist back then, of creating a sort of uh, representative sub-cohort that could be used for case cohort or case control analyses, which would probably be very cost efficient you know, from a here perspective, since you wouldn't have to do quite as many samples, you could do these nested samples in order to address similar questions. Is, is ECHO at a point where that type of cohort could be designed? And if so, is there um, movement towards that? So Bob, that's a great question. And it's true that the case cohort design or even case control designs, but maybe uh, particularly in cohort studies, the case cohort design is a nice efficient sample for that. Um, and the, 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 I would say the echo floor is open for analysis of proposals to use that kind of approach. Um, it is true that um, we are let's say we have engaged here fairly fully for the next couple of years, but we're definitely open to ideas for using here, either for the chemicals that are already being assayed, which I think is not your question, but maybe some new ones that can uh, be done through the case cohort uh, analysis um, uh, design. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, so I understand that, um, Trevor, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. I wonder if the ECHO program would consider new cohorts uh, and how married you are to existing ones. I was struck, for example, in your uh, presentation on phthalates, for example, it would seem to me that a good cohort to have uh, in that study would be children that have been in the NICU because of the plastics they're exposed to in all the tubing they have in terms of uh, keeping them uh, alive and getting them well again. And it would seem to me that the phthalate measurements would be really high in those children. It'd be really good to follow them longitudinally. Thanks very much for that question. And indeed we have um, a mini consortium of uh, NICU babies which form several cohorts within ECHO. And uh, this went by very fast, but one of the investigators, Anne-Marie Sustrup, is actually looking at phthalates in the nursery, especially looking at those related to um, the technologies used in the nursery. And it started to publish at least some descriptive data on that. So we look forward to ECHO investigators 
looking at associations between that exposure to phthalates and some of the outcomes within the ECHO program. Yes, yeah, so that already exists. Thanks very much for that. So the other part of that question was, does ECHO, will ECHO consider new cohorts? Um, in this cycle of ECHO, a seven year cycle starting in 2016, um, we uh, awarded um, all of the cohorts that are in the program. Um, they were all pre-existing and they're ongoing. So um, they're all, most of them recruited prenatally. Some of the NICU cohorts re uh, recruited at birth and they're all following the children longitudinally. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I, I want to note that um, Susan posted the link to the ECHO RFI in the chat. Uh, if you guys want to access that and, and respond to it, um, please feel free to do so. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, Katrina, and then Terrence. Sure. Um, thank you for that great presentation. Um, you know, obviously being from Rochester, I'm really interested in ECHO stuff because we have a couple cohorts here. And my conversations with the ECHO researchers tend to go like this. Wow, that's really cool. Amazing stuff that you found. So what about their housing? Where are they from? And they don't have any of that information that would make it possible for us to actually say anything interesting about their environmental exposures, their exposome. So um, this is leading to a question of, of um, how you're dealing with that going forward. And I think your conversation about the geomarkers is part of that. But I also think there's you've learned so much that would be great to feed back into the system, by which I mean separate conversation we've been having with our EMR provider about, under the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts here has been looking at fields related to social determinants of health mm -hmm. and how those companies really get to decide what gets collected. And that there are great models from exposure scientists out, out there of a few small questions that could be built in. And if they were consistent would then be populating the records of all the kids and all the cohorts when you're able to merge with clinical data. So I guess my question is whether um, you've been pushing out standards that can guide collection of environmental exposure, social determinants data to the cohorts and also considered this sort of the private EMR systems as a way mm -hmm. to push out what you've learned. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for that question. Um, so I think there are three answers. One is you've already mentioned the geospatial approaches. Um, so that gives us some idea about sort of the broad, <clears throat> the broad purview. When we get down to individual exposures, we have created the echo wide cohort protocol. Much of that protocol is uh, self or proxy reports. And there are um, elements in there about um, uh, environmental exposures, and that does include some housing. Your third point is about, can we actually influence what goes into private EMRs? That we haven't tackled yet. Yes, we do get data from EMR, especially in the prenatal period and the perinatal period, but we haven't actually um, tackled whether or not we as a program can influence what goes in there. But thanks very much for that suggestion. Thank you, uh, Terrence. Matt, thank you so much. A really wonderful uh, overview of the program, very exciting. I had a question related to public-private partnerships, especially in the context of imaging, um, geospatial information, and to what extent the program would be welcoming, I guess, of those kinds of um, relationships. I'm thinking, for instance, some of the private companies that do satellite imaging at high cadence, uh, high resolution imaging, that do have partnerships uh, with academics anyway that, that uh, can be exploited. And especially in the context of time sensitive um, exposures, uh, thinking again about uh, you know, late pregnancy and asthma and PM, it's, it's one example, but there's probably many others uh, that could, be, could take advantage of such information. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, as a program, we haven't uh, yet um, delved into public-private partnerships. Um, I did show you the, the, um, some of the work that's being done using the satellite images. I think that's from the available satellite images. Um, and so um, I'd like some more information actually about what we might be able to gather 
um, using more proprietary information. Thanks very much. I'm thinking particularly of companies like uh, planet.com. You see them in the news a lot, but they have already a lot of uh, relationships with um, government agencies. And it would be interesting to see if we could uh, incorporate companies like that into the program. Yeah, thanks a lot for that suggestion. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Hi there. Um, hi, Matt. Hello. Matt knows me well. I, I chaired uh, the Echo Science um, Advisory uh, Committee for a while. Um, I have really been, Matt, um, interested in a, a couple of the questions that you received here, um, especially from Katrina and Trevor. I mean, one thing I'm well aware of, and, and you didn't really emphasize it very much, but the Echo cohort is a completely new way of doing a cohort study, a large cohort, in terms of of bringing together existing cohorts, supporting them, um, coordinating them, uh, creating scientific collaborations among them. It's it's a really exciting model, and it wasn't necessarily obvious at the outset that it was going to work, I'm going to say. And I think that it has gone magnificently well. Um, but I, I just love, um, you know, the notion, you know, from, you know, both Trevor and Katrina, of maybe being able to over time, maybe not in this particular cycle, but over time, seeing this model extended and in two ways. I mean, one being that the platform that has been developed and the tools that have been developed, um, the NIH should be able to support new cohorts by um, somehow, um, quote, including them you know, in ECHO, uh, making, making some of those tools available. The data systems are fabulous and the availability the ability to harmonize on um, especially the environmental variables, but also some of the phenotypical variables that we care about with children's health. Um, that's something that's often a, a, a problem um, with our studies that at the end of the day, we have trouble um, doing systematic reviews and meta-analyses because of the, the disparate way that data is collected. But, uh, but I also love the idea, I think really um, coming from Katrina that there are other cohorts out there that are developing tools for assessing things like housing and housing quality that maybe haven't been in, in the ECHO. And I know you have ways now to interest researchers in developing new tools for ECHO, um, but that maybe over time uh, that could be more intentional in terms of new cohorts that are funded, you know, specifically uh, partly, you know, developing uh, tools that could then be used by other cohorts. Um, I, I think that the collaborate, and, and I guess the bottom line is, I think the collaboration and the collaborative, collaborative space that's being cre um, created is working a lot better than um, most of us would have expected in terms of the history and science of people, you know, being very siloed in their individual um, areas. So thank you. Thanks, Len. And let me take this opportunity to thank you for chairing our external scientific board over the first five years, it's been extremely valuable. Um, and also to say that we're working across NIH um, in uh, harmonizing data systems and elements. There are a number of um, approaches across the NIH, for example, in common data elements. Um, and one place that actually we were, um, we were contributory was in developing um, COVID-19 questionnaires and surveys uh, for our participants, which are now publicly available for use for pregnant women and children and have been used quite widely. I didn't uh, focus on our COVID-19 work here, but it is ongoing. And I also um, take the suggestion that, um, you know, we not only have the opportunity and are doing work to complement what's going on across NIH, but as you say, to inform what's going on in the in the research world. Um, and also, I think you were making the point that as we move forward, we have the opportunity to innovate and to bring in new uh, elements and subjects, topics, measures, um, so that we're uh, uh, on the cutting edge of environmental science. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Gilman, and uh, everyone for your attention and your questions and uh, comments uh, that added to the discussion. I want to note that Lindsay Martin uh, posted a link to the Phoenix um, toolkit uh, in the in the chat. Um, 
And I think we're at time now before our break. Rick, do you uh, want to make comments before we go on uh, to our break? No, I want to uh, thank Matt for an absolutely a terrific talk. Um, we'll be talking some more. I'd be very interested to know how we can take those data collection and data management systems you have for ECHO and perhaps uh, see more intersections with things like the All of Us and other programs that are happening across the NIH. So, and kind of building on yesterday's discussion with the exposome as well. So we'll we'll be talking more about that. But I don't I don't want to um, minimize the break for everyone. So we'll we'll be in touch now. And thank you again for joining us. Well, thanks for the opportunity to the council members and to you, Rick. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. And um, so we have a break for 15 minutes. Um, so go ahead and grab your lunch and be back here in um, 15 minutes at 1.15 uh, p.m. Remember to mute your line and stop your video while on break. See you at 1.15. <laughs>